What's up guys, Stall Matter here, and today we're gonna to be reacting to a, another Sam Aronow video. So these are obviously the, the videos on the history of Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, and this one we are now on to the Jewish Empire, 103 to 67 BC. So link to the original video down below and let's jump into it. Oh. 103 BCE, the Hellenistic world is coming to an end. Greece itself has been under Roman rule for over half a century. The Seleucid Empire, which once terrorized the Jews, is now barely larger than Judea itself. Now, the nations of West Asia will determine their own fate. A Jewish queen will rise higher than any king before her, and for a single generation, Judea will become an empire. When we last left off, Judea was in crisis. The tyrannical reign of Aristobulus, the first Jewish king since the Davidic period, had lasted just a year. His widow Alexandra had engineered a coup against his chosen successor. The reigns of autumn had brought forth a new political order, led by a 24-year-old king, Alexander Yanai, and his 38-year-old queen. However, the constitutional crisis that had unfolded under Alexander's father and brother remained unresolved. The Pharisees continued to argue that no one man could serve as both king and high priest. Alexandra should have been in the perfect position to resolve the crisis. She had proven her political skills by engineering the palace coup, and her younger brother, Simon ben Shetach, was a rising star among the Pharisees and would soon be elected to the great Sanhedrin. But then something quite unexpected happened. At 38 years old, Alexandra became pregnant. By 40, she had given birth to two sons, and raising them at this advanced age would largely remove her from politics for the time being. This left King Alexander to untangle the political deadlock between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he might actually have done that if foreign affairs hadn't gotten in the way. Several years earlier, an Egyptian prince named Ptolemy Lathyrus had set up a breakaway kingdom in Cyprus after losing a civil war to his mother. In the ensuing years, he had successfully gained dominion over the former Phoenician city-states, including the Seleucid enclaves that still existed along Judea's coastline. Sensing an opportunity to secure an alliance with its most powerful neighbor, Judea declared war on Ptolemy. The first phase of the conflict was a complete disaster, with Ptolemy invading the Galilee and committing all manner of war crimes. But after securing assistance from the Egyptian army, Alexander managed to not only retake the Galilee, but conquer the Golan Heights. There he encountered the Etorians, an Arab tribe renowned as mounted archers, and made them a deal. Not only would the Eturians be allowed to live peacefully as Judean subjects, What's this music from? I recognize it. Do, 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 do. But they would be welcome to convert to Judaism in order oh, that their unique Zelda, fighting skills be put to use in the Judean army. With a newfound cavalry in tow, Alexander successfully conquered Dor, time. and by 96 BCE had conquered Gaza. But this Wait, lad did he just conquer into Egyptian territory? Cavalry in tow, Alexander successfully conquered Dor, and by 96 BCE had conquered Gaza. Okay, so when they did they go to war with Egypt, or is this just like a map error that he made here? But this latter move was a problem. Alexander wasn't supposed to take Gaza. That task had been given to another Egyptian ally, the Arab kingdom of Nabatea, but the Judean army had reached the city first with its fancy new horses. By taking Gaza, Judea now had a monopoly on trade between the Arabian Peninsula and the Mediterranean Sea, giving Alexander the power to utterly dominate Nabatea economically. And so, war. In 93 BCE, Alexander was pinned in the Yarmouk River Valley by, no joke, a camel cavalry, sued for peace, and limped back to Jerusalem with his tail between his legs. Judea managed to keep all of its new territories, including Gaza, but- Camels are actually super effective in the desert. Um, I mean, obviously, right? <laughs> There's a reason they were used. Uh, but even like in the Sahara, for example, one of the big things that allowed trans-Saharan trade was the introduction of the camel, bringing the camel down there, and then it allowed like the Berber tribes and stuff to become like vastly more successful and uh you know interact a lot with different peoples this is why berbers who are an afro-asiatic people so they originated in the levant right but if you if you meet a berber some of them are like very white looking like they'll pass as white right they have blonde hair blue eyes and then you'll meet somebody that's a berber from the same tribe or maybe the tribe right next to them 
who um, like looks like a sub-Saharan African. And the reason they have such a drastic, like all these you know different, uh, like these va- vastly dr- different phenotypes, is because of the camel. The camel allowed them to have this massive trade network. Um, but anyway, yeah. It lost control over its own eastern border. At this point, Alexander had been in power for a decade, during which domestic policy was basically non-existent, and his dual role as king and high priest had been impossible to fulfill. That Sukkot, which coincidentally was the 10th anniversary of his coronation, Alexander entered the gates of Jerusalem only to be met with angry, jeering crowds in the tens of thousands. Sukkot is the Jewish harvest festival, and usually coincides with the first rainfall after the long, dry summer. Traditionally, worshippers must purchase this snarly-looking fruit called an etrog for the holiday, and when Alexander began the opening ceremony, the men in attendance used them to pelt him. (laughs) if you're Jewish, you're probably thinking two things. That's hilarious, and those are heavy. Now imagine getting whipped by hundreds of them. In retaliation, Alexander called on a personal force of mercenaries from Asia Minor to execute 6,000 of the worshippers, boarded up the temple complex, and declared war on the Pharisees who again were the majority party, so he may as well have declared war on his own country. To that end, the bulk of the great Sanhedrin relocated to the city of Sepphoris in the Galilee. Oh, so From there, the Simon war. ben Shetach, now deputy leader of the Pharisees, called for assistance from, of all people, the new Seleucid king, Demetrius III. In 89 BCE, a combined force of Seleucids and Pharisees dealt Alexander a devastating blow at Shechem wiping out all of Alexander's foreign mercenaries just 50 kilometers from Jerusalem. The defeat was so overwhelming that Alexander went into hiding in the mountains, and it looked like the Pharisees would soon win the war. But then, as was the case more often than not at this point, the Seleucid Empire collapsed into a civil war of its own, forcing Demetrius to withdraw his forces and abandon the Pharisees to their fate. They basically had three choices. Almost the entire Pharisee army, the ordinary rank and file, defected back to Alexander and the Sadducees. The highest ranking politicians, like Simon ben Shetach, used their connections. So it seems that these guys have like no actual uh, allegiance other than power, right? It's whoever they think is going to win, they're going to align themselves with. Which, I mean, to be fair, that's like true of most historical battles, right? You see like that with the aristocracy in so many different areas, where they'll betray their own people or their own supposed beliefs the second they think that they can benefit from another belief set and resources to flee the country, mostly for Egypt. This left 800 Pharisee lieutenants to a truly sadistic fate. First, they were rounded up in the plaza between the Temple Mount and the Hasmonean Palace. There, King Alexander brought out the Pharisees' wives and children to be cut down by the sword while they helplessly watched. Finally, the 800 men were crucified while Alexander watched over a celebratory feast. And it's here where we reach one of the great ironies of Jewish history. By winning the war so brutally, he had lost the peace. Most of the Jews living in Diaspora were sympathetic to the Pharisees. And while nobody could defeat Alexander militarily, they could defeat him politically. And it just so happened that his two sons had recently reached adulthood, freeing up Queen Alexandra to do what she did best. Around 87 BCE, Alexander held a dinner for a visiting delegation from the Parthian Empire. The king and his guests drank and talked through the entire night. But at a lull in the conversation, one of the Parthians worked up the courage to note a conspicuous absence. Where is Rabbi Simon? he asked. We have always enjoyed and profited by his wisdom in our previous visits. At this, Queen Alexandra spoke. My brother is away in Egypt, but I'm sure he will return soon. She cast her eyes at her husband. After 16 years shut away in the nursery, she was once more the senior partner. Two weeks later... Oh, wait, so did his... Did her brother end up getting killed with the other Pharisees? Simon returned from exile in Egypt, regained his seat in the Great Sanhedrin, then he arrived at dinner with the Parthians, taking a seat directly between the king and queen. Alexander was silent, until Simon turned and said, The wisdom which I serve grants me equal rank with kings. With that, the last vestiges of absolute monarchy in Judea were swept away. While Alexander busied himself with ever more military conquests, 
Simon and Alexandra worked tirelessly to flip control of the Great Sanhedrin. Throughout the 80s BCE, Judea's cities began replacing their Sadducee representatives with Pharisees until they comprised almost half of the Sanhedrin. Pharisee leaders forced into exile were invited back, and the high priesthood was reformed from a hereditary position to an elected one. Alexander Yanai spent the rest of his life on campaign beyond the walls of Jerusalem, a prisoner in his own kingdom, which is why on his deathbed in 76 BCE, he left the throne not to either of his adult sons, but to Alexandra. This was her empire. Alexander had been ill for some time, and had summoned the queen to his death. This man might be the most henpecked man of all time. <laughs> Poor bastard. <laughs> bed while leading a siege at Ragaba, a fortress on the Nabataean border. Alexandra kept her husband's death secret so as not to lower morale until the fortress had fallen. But when the Jews triumphed, Alexandra returned to Jerusalem as queen regnant. Within a year, the Pharisees had become the majority in the Sanhedrin, with Simon as Nasi. Alexandra's eldest son, Hyrcanus, was made high priest, finally separating the power of the temple and the state in accordance with Pharisee policy. The Pharisees also created a bunch of new laws, establishing a formal education system and criminalizing perjury and obstruction of justice without exception. Ultimately, under Simon ben Shetach, the Sanhedrin became so powerful that periods of Jewish history started being defined not by the reigns of the monarch, but by the terms of office of the Nasi and Av Bet Din known collectively as the Zugot. Meanwhile, Sadducee ministers who had committed atrocities in the Civil War were increasingly found in bed with swords run through them. Desperate for protection, the Sadducees recruited Alexandra's younger son, Prince Aristobulus, to lobby his mother on their behalf. Alexandra agreed to let the Sadducees flee Jerusalem and defend the borders of the kingdom. But in reality, it was all for show as Alexandra was already recruiting a huge army of foreign mercenaries to deter any neighboring powers that might want to take a piece of the empire. And lest you think she was going power mad like either of her husbands, Alexandra's proclivity towards nonpartisan foreign fighters was not only prudent, but absolutely necessary for the time. Over the previous decade, the entirety of West Asia had devolved into a chaotic free-for-all as the Seleucid Empire collapsed once and for all into a confusing network of city-states leading its neighbors to the north, Pontus and Armenia, to make a play for the entire region in what became known as the Mithridatic Wars. As many of these city-states were Roman allies, one might expect a rapid response. But Rome at this time was undergoing multiple civil wars, from the slave uprising of Spartacus to the repeated clashes between Marius and Sulla. The Romans were able to keep it together just long enough to stop Pontus from conquering all of Greece and Anatolia, but Armenia had free reign. By the time of Alexandra's coronation, the Armenian king Tigranes the Great had stitched together an empire stretching from the Caspian to the Mediterranean. Is that Armenia at its peak? That's gotta be, like, that's the biggest I've ever seen Armenia. That's gotta be near, like, the peak of Armenian power. In 69 BCE, power. Alexandra sent emissaries to Tigranes, assuring him that unlike the nations he had already conquered, he would find no fault with the Jewish people or their queen. Tigranes was impressed with the ambassadors, and assured them that he would keep Judea and the queen in his favor, after his armies marched into Jerusalem. At long last, it appeared that these two unlikely empires would finally clash. But, just as it happened so many times to the Maccabees a century earlier, salvation came in the form of a letter. The slave revolt in Italy was over, and the Romans were on the march. Pontus had already fallen, and Western Armenia was in flames. Tigranes rushed back to Armenia, his empire crumbling behind him, only to be defeated by the Romans at the Battle of Tigranocerta. But the Jewish Empire would not last much longer. In 67 BCE, Alexandra died, and the power and prosperity of Judea would go with her. She had failed to heal the violent divisions between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who had each found a royal champion in her two sons. Because of this, the final battle of the Mithridatic Wars would be fought not in Pontus or Armenia, but in the streets of Jerusalem. And it's kind of sad how, how many times throughout history you see brothers or cousins or, you know, whatever, like all these different people who are, who are related just constantly going to war with each other. And it, like, it's always for personal political gain, and 
Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. And it, and it rarely ever ends well. It it almost always ends poorly for for the state and for those people as well. Like it, you know. I mean, you're guaranteed to lo- one of them is going to lose, right? So it obviously ends bad for them. But then even, in, you know, in victory, a lot of the time it's a Pyrrhic victory, right? Like, the, the state's in much worse shape, and then they get conquered from somebody else. And it's kind of crazy how many times that happens and how many great empires have fallen because of rivalries between a lot of the time people that are, like, literally related to each other. And, like, not, not like, distantly related. Like, you know, he's my 20th cousin or something. I'm, we're the same ethnic group, so we're somehow related. But, like, related, like, oh, yeah, his, his grandma and my, my grandpa are brother and sister. It's, it's so sad. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.